Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Gorrell, um, Marketing Director for InfoGlen, and uh, welcome to the first in a series of webinar-based conversations. It's our intention to bring these, two, these live sessions to you on a monthly basis in the hopes that we can shed some light on some topics and some questions that you may have uh, around the technology stack, even from a broad a broad brush perspective. InfoGlen um, is a Silicon Valley based CRM services provider and we're a Salesforce Silver Consulting partner that specializes in delivering high quality Salesforce solutions and helping our partner clients companies leverage the Salesforce platform to increase the effectiveness and the efficiency of their operation. We realize that you have choices as to where you spend your time this afternoon. And so on behalf of everyone here at InfoGlen, I wanna let you know a, a hearty thank you uh, for taking the time to uh, share it with us this afternoon, or this morning. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes is that um, I got you all on mute uh, for the benefit uh, of the speakers, and I'd like, you know, want to make sure that the speaker's uh, dialogue is, is covered and that you don't miss anything. However, if you'll see at the bottom, there's a chat box, and that is open. And if you have a question of our panelists, then uh, please put that uh, question in the box, and uh, we'll address them at the end of the uh, speaker's session. Now, I'd like to introduce to you the, uh, our uh, panelists. Um, first of all, um, our special guest today, and is actually a current client of InfoGlen, is John Herson. And John is the Senior Manager Enterprise Architecture at Rapid7. Uh, John is well known as a subject matter expert on quite a number of topics. His technical skills have been designated as great assets to the organizations that he served throughout his career. And he's always been viewed as a guy that's willing to go the extra distance to get the job done correctly. John, welcome to the uh, chat. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. My pleasure. Our second panel uh, member is uh, our own C CEO, Haroon Ahmad. He's also our Chief Salesforce Architect for InfoGlen. Haroon's a results-driven and innovative technology leader that's specializing in CRM and Salesforce.com uh, technologies. Before starting in InfoGlen, Haroon helped define and implement Salesforce and CRM strategies and roadmaps for companies like Google, YouTube, and Dell, where they were designed to empower the sales marketing team uh, to maximize their capabilities. Haroon's been a key driver in implementing multiple CRM solutions to allow teams to scale, optimize, and, and, and increase the value of their internal business processes. Thank you, Haroon, for taking the time out to be with us today. And our third... Thank you, sir. My pleasure. My, our third panel member is also a, um, a player with uh, um, uh, InfoGlen. He's our senior Salesforce architect, Alex Selwyn. If you're looking for somebody um, capable of operating a very complex Salesforce CRM implementation project, Alex has always been the guy. He owns a very unique mix of deep and ever-increasing techno technical capabilities and has amazing client interfacing skills. We consider him one of our major assets and we're pleased and very fortunate that he was able to spare some time today uh, to be on uh, on this uh, show with us. Welcome, Alex. Now, Peter. what I'd like to do, uh, if I could, um, Haroon, is perhaps I'd like get you to kick it off with maybe a, a, a little bit of a background on the CPQ um, space itself, maybe some of its history, and then maybe help uh, and, and between yourself and Alex, maybe kind of warm us up to um, you know, the conversation. Take Thanks it a lot, Peter. Thanks a lot, Peter, and appreciate, appreciate the introduction. Um, so um, we are, uh, 
this is the first in the series of webinars that that we have planned. Um, I want, want to take a minute to talk about you know what our goal and vision for for this series is. It's basically for us to come together as um, and bring together the you know good industry leaders and decision makers and implementation partners and engineers and you know BAs and everybody who's potentially involved in the CRM slash Salesforce space to get them to talk, to get them to engage with each other, to learn a little bit, and just make, uh, you know, just, just an event for us to, for us to chat about uh, stuff that we like to do. So hopefully uh, we will uh, make it a regular event for, for folks to um, be able to uh, take part in. Um, thanks, thanks so much uh, for the introductions, Peter. I, I again want to thank uh, John Hersan um, for taking the time uh, out of his very, very busy schedule. I know he's extremely busy driving some very key strategic initiatives uh, at Rapid7, transformative, uh, I would say, and has been kind enough uh, to take the time to attend this. And I, I'm, I'm sure we'll benefit from some of the, you know, very innovative uh, and um, impactful work being being done by his team um, at Rapid7. Uh, I also really want to thank Alex um, for taking the time out. He has been um, a, a long time friend and as well as a great individual who's able to have a unique blend of you know, business and technology um, capabilities. And, and that's a strong mix that he brings to the table. I think one of the things I want to talk about is um, one of the, one of the things to talk about is what is this whole CPQ thing? You know, I actually got introduced to this maybe a few years ago. I in one of my visits to Dreamforce, and they gave me a book called CPQ for Dummies, and I like what is this CPQ for Dummies? You know, I. I I never ever opened, I had it on my table, maybe for three years, maybe for four years, I never opened it. I said, yeah, some kind of product thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't think too much of it. To me, it was a bit of a dry and a boring subject actually. We're like, yeah, you do some product and pricing and what's the big deal about that? But over time, we realized that uh, there was a transformation happening in the CPQ space. And what started as a back office tool in the, you know, once computing came to uh, the selling space, it transformed into a very much a tool for in the hands of salespeople and many, many different areas. I mean, think about it, right? CPQ is every single company needs to sell. And what they need to sell, they need to be able to configure or at least put prices on as they sell. In terms of, so, so that what, what to me was a very dry topic in the sense that, yes, I mean, there was, it was not very, I mean, there was no human face to the whole CPQ space. I quickly realized that there's the whole uh, transformation on online selling and subscription-based selling uh, was putting a, a whole new uh, focus on the CPQ space. And, and Salesforce realized that, and partners in Salesforce realized that, they built a bunch of technologies which came from back office tool to the CRM um, space. And you, know, you had companies like Aptus and, and others quickly becoming huge players in the app exchange market. Uh, Steelbrick came along and it was you know, acquired by, did well, and it was acquired by Salesforce. And so here we are with Salesforce CPQ. Uh, before I hand it, before I go any further, I'd just like to, from my perspective, um, what, why should you be looking at CPQ? It's a, a couple of reasons, or two or three reasons, I think. Right? One is efficiency, obviously, right? Efficiency of uh, people's you know, time and integrations and accuracy. Actually, efficiency and accuracy are two key things why you need a CPQ tool. But those are probably not the most, I mean, if you have efficiency and accuracy, uh, that's, that's okay. I think those are important drivers, but the other two I think are transparency, right? You want to be able to uh, share it with your partners and with your team, why a certain thing is priced and what will change when you change 
a few things here and there. So transparency is something that CPQ brings in. And then finally, I think, and transparency, not just to your team, but to, uh, you know, to your partners and your customer that, hey, what am I selling at what price and how will it change if you change this? And I think the last thing that is going, that is the trend that I think uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, my colleague Leela will talk about a little bit later, is uh, the trends, right? What are the trends in the CPQ market? Mm. And one of the trends is for uh, the CPQ tools to play around with the prices, for AI to talk about how you can look at a customer's uh, not, uh, buying trends and, and, with, and match it with products and history and, and, and you know, industry data and suggest pricing and discounts and bundling uh, all that is done manually right, manually right now. How can you bring AI into that mix? Uh, and that's something I think. Then it becomes a very powerful tool because, you know, like, I mean, potentially like gas prices, uh, we could be changing uh, pricing of our products in B2B space if we can bring in enough powerful data to drive uh, that, those pricing decisions. So... You know, that's sort of the high level overview. I'm going to jump into uh, the, we, ha we, we have a few uh, decks that Alex has put together. So I think what we'll do is bring up a few of those and talk through them. We will, we will, so, and then, so we, once you've covered a few of those, we're going to get into uh, some, uh, we'll talk about specific things with John and then hopefully get into Q and A in about, at around about 11.45 or so. Okay. So we have a, a, all right. Okay, so let me just uh, bring up uh, our... So the deck that I, so the one of the first things that I think we want to spend a little bit of time on is what is this CPQ thing and what are the elements of CPQ and what are the surrounding technologies around CPQ? All right, so we are looking at, and this is, I, I think this is a strong comprehensive uh, visualization of what makes up CPQ. And a lot of you, by the way, let me just give a disclaimer. For some of you, this is like very, very basic and you guys know all this. For some of you, maybe these are too many details. So we try to keep relatively high level, but please keep your questions and you know, we can discuss them at the end. So um, Alex, I'll let you uh, dive into this diagram and talk about uh, your understanding of what these elements are, and then I might have a few questions for you on that. Sure. Um, thanks for the uh, overview on CPQ. It was very good. Um, so this uh, high-level architecture kind of uh, depicts where uh, CPQ sits in the uh, overall ecosystem. Um, so, um, CPQ has uh, three main pillars like CP and Q, configure, price, and, um, and, and code. Um, so, starting from uh, how complex you can bundle your product, where you know, when a product has um, multiple attributes and your bundle has multiple products, so uh, the configuration of uh, what is a a valid bundle and, and what you can uh, actually cook your customers is a very, very um, uh, powerful tool for any uh, company. And then uh, you have pricing. How do you want to price your product? How, do, how, how are you selling the um, um, product to your customer? And then how well are you taking your code to the customer? How efficiently, how accurately you're taking to the customer, uh, code to the customer uh, forms the core of uh, CPQ. But if you note that you know we have added renewals, amendments, and contracts into the into the mix, which is essentially you know the uh, stuff that kind of kicks off after we um, after we uh, send and and the and, and the code is um, signed. The reason being, you know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, 
businesses are uh, looking into a recurring revenue model where um, you know uh, perpetual licenses are in the past and, and, and companies are moving toward more towards subscription based uh, model so we think that you know renewal amendments and in in the uh, the recurring business model is um, you know going to be the fourth pillar of cpq and it's it's going to be part and parcel of um, uh, any cpq implementation and so is uh, sales for cpq it's it's uh, uh, deeply baked into the system um, and you can see the other surrounding um, um, elements or components that actually talks to the um, uh, CPQ system. The, the first being the um, uh, CRM itself. Um, Salesforce CPQ being a native product Alex, kind of let sits. Me, um, Alex, let me, let me uh, interrupt you if I can for a moment. One of the things, Alex, I do want to ask about is um, guided selling and why and some of the other elements are more well known but I don't think you know enough about guided selling at least I don't uh, if you can highlight that piece of CPQ and uh, that would be awesome uh, sure um, guided selling is uh, I mean it's been uh, um, you know it's been around for some time. I mean, the, the, the term may be new, but uh, it's the it's three basic question, right? Um, uh, to whom are we selling? Uh, what are we selling? And at what price um, are we selling? So uh, when we uh, combine all three and give uh, that uh, information or bubble that information to the sales shop, it becomes um, very, very powerful. They don't have to go and look around like a bunch of places to figure out what is the best discount that they could give or um, what um, attributes or what components of a deal that they can tweak to get the discount that the um, customer needs. For example, the customer wants 20 percent discount, uh, while a 36 month contract will require your VP approval for a 20 percent discount, uh, extending the term to 60 percentage. Um, might actually give um, the you know the uh, customer expected discount without any approval process. Thereby, um, you know that information is key. Shortening the sales, shortening the sales cycle, closing the deals more faster instead of just pushing the uh, code to the um, the approval process. All the rep want, needs to know is hey, if I can adjust the term to sixty uh, months. I could very well give the discount without any kind of. So basically, uh, Alex, based on so what you're saying is based on the customer, the deal size, and the product, and all that. Suggest to the agent that hey, this is the this is what I we think that you should offer to this guy. To this is right. and, and from a uh, you know uh, Salesforce CPQ, um, um, Salesforce has invested a lot in Einstein and and. Uh, um, Einstein uh, pricing prediction kind of integrates well with um, guided selling. So if, uh, if a company has a lot of uh, history of, you know, what they have sold, what customer at what price point, uh, Einstein can really predict uh, a discount score, um, which can be fed into the code configurator. So uh, it kind of like completes a full circle where, you know, from the past data, we are predicting you know, what uh, discount that we can give. So Alex, here's my question on that. How much of what you're saying is like a hype and a marketing uh, push from Salesforce and how much adoption do you feel we have seen of guided selling? And maybe John wants to take this question or between the two of you guys would be great to just get an idea on that because a lot of Einstein has not taken off um, and adoption has been low. So uh, it's a great question, Harun. Um, I I think um, in my experience, I think we haven't uh, or I haven't really um, done um, you know a, a full fledged implementation on um, bringing in the Einstein pricing data into the uh, Salesforce CPQ. But we do have set up uh, some um, you know uh, the the discount. Uh, range using uh, manual data set. I mean, sales ops can come up with a bunch of uh, uh, data on you know what is their floor and what is their median and what's the yeah. best 
um, and, and we can feed that. That's a pretty common implementation that I've seen. Um, yeah. The uh, Einstein implementation, you know, price, getting the pricing score uh, through Einstein is still, um, you know, in its, uh, um, uh, in its early stage. Uh, so I see a lot of... Yeah. Uh, and for whatever reason, I mean, Einstein's in, in, a, in a bunch of Salesforce implementations that, you know, we are seeing, we are not seeing Einstein make it to the roadmap in, even in the last couple of years. So whatever that reason is, I think it's still lagging behind. So I don't know, this is RK, I joined in late. Um, but, you know, I'm always curious about Einstein. I'm RK from Boeing, by the way. Um, hey, hey, have, RK. Welcome. Hey, I'm, while, while you guys are talking about Einstein, and that is something that I've been trying to, like, you know, for a year now, get some insights into Salesforce Einstein and how we leverage that intelligence capability within what we're doing. And this is the sure. key point, right, where sales pricing, Einstein can give a good recommendation. But the thing is that, what is it that, uh, is it is it based on the inputs that nobody is able to adopt it right? Is it uh, because, you know, the machine learning model needs a, needs a data model to build upon, right? It has to, it has to have the basic inputs to build the intelligence and the usage based on it, correct? Correct, um, correct. Now, is it, is it because the way all of us are thinking sales process in a sense that where they you know the salesperson or the sales product management sets up pricing rules or tra like a traditional pricing rules and that is not helping the ML model to yeah. be effective, right? Be an effective right. thing because where you're again constantly going and changing it then the ML has no value to you and you're like, you know, what is this doing to me, right? It's not really good yeah. value add. So I, I, I'm just talking Einstein in a much more global sense that, you know, that is what I kind of was thinking was that is Einstein not being presented by Salesforce where it, they come up with models, preloaded models that people yeah. can leverage out of the gate? Without that, yeah. I don't know, you know, if it's really helping even on the reporting side, because I was trying to think about Einstein helping right. us with some analytic reports, but... Yeah, right. Again, you know, it's like me having to define everything. And if I'm defining everything, I might as well, like, you know, put it there and get what I need, right? I don't know what yeah. additional effort. RK, I think it's a combination of uh, combination of uh, and lack of data. Salesforce trying to do a combination of completely out of the box versus, uh, you know, versus completely custom. So I think there are many, many reasons, uh, RK, that Einstein hasn't taken off. But, you know, we'll... We'll uh, we'll have a more detailed discussion on that. On that, but so. is that something that Infoglen is uh, is like you know working with Salesforce? How are you guys engaged on on that specific subject? I'm, I'm, Specifically I'm on Einstein. Yeah, we 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 are RK. We have worked. Uh, we have worked with with them. I think we need a leverage and push both from our customers and for from Salesforce. And on both sides, you know, we've seen that it's not making the top of the priority list for whatever reason. So um, no. I think we are, we are yeah, but the efforts are on and I'm, you know, it's about identifying the right use cases and how easily they can be done. So it's a combination of impact versus the effort and that's combination is, is you know, we're not seeing that in a big way yet. Oh. Okay, so um, we want to... Um, Anything else on this deck that uh, John, this slide that John, you or Alex want to highlight? No, I think this is a pretty good indication of all the different uh, components of CPQ. CPQ itself is not a, is a, a very complex, uh, very robust piece of technology. And so this is a good depiction of all the different components that make up CPQ. It's, uh, it, it, you know, it's not your standard Salesforce where you have more of a, a blank canvas of things that you can configure with workflows or process builders or add your own field. There is a certain set of assumptions that, that they made as they built out CPQ. And so that's, uh, you, you start to see that when you're, when you're trying to extend CPQ in ways that there's things that you, you have to either uh, leverage from the platform itself and, and take their best practices or or you're going to go down this path that could lead you into a corner that you won't be able to recover from. So it's kind of right. understanding the complexity that they offer and why they've done the things that they've done. And then yeah. that helps guide your decisions as to how you 
implement around these different components. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yep. That makes sense. Is um, um, and and believe. Go ahead. So, sorry, I was just saying that I think we can spend a day. Uh, <laughs> just talking about these blocks because I think there is so much to talk about yeah. here. We can talk about, you know, orders versus contracts and why, well, you know, we can talk about the flow. We can talk about at, at what point is asset created. We can talk about, you know, uh, subscription assets. So there's a lot to talk about, but I would, you know, request you guys to hold your questions and we will come to them um, at, at the Actually, if I could just if I could just interject because I I know I, I, we let some we let some people in a little later on uh, halfway through and they missed some of the housekeeping points. But um, if there's an if you do have a question, there is chat box. Pop it in. Pop it in while you're thinking about it, and we'll touch uh, we'll touch base with the uh, question uh, at the end of the session. Uh, but I appreciate uh, RK's input there. That was uh, very good. No, absolutely. That was a that's, a, that's an important point. And I'm, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm very, much so. very much so. Um, I was wondering if we could, I was wondering if we could might move the conversation more toward, you know, what really makes up the recipe of a, a successful implementation and sort of walk, work into some of the nuances that are, that are, are probably pretty important from a, operationals perspective if i'm looking at this thing i'm saying what am i faced with you know what what am i up against what are my risks for 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 not doing it right if, if we can maybe address that between i'd like to actually uh, understand you know um what john's perspective is on, on that front as well as uh, as well as our own thanks all right so i guess i'll take that one first so uh, yeah, one of the, some of the, the things to consider is you resist the temptation to just jump right in and start doing things. I think with the with CPQ it is such a critical component of, of any any business, and there's so much uh, business logic that can be embedded in there that if you don't think about these things you know, well in advance and really lay out a, a strategy and a vision for where you want to go, you can end up uh, you know you end up going a, a bunch of different routes that are not going to take you to help you achieve your goals, and so. I think really understanding what what how how you want to sell, and then on top of that, what's the customer experience? Because you, you, if you don't think about the customer experience, you're only optimizing towards the the internal experience. You could then uh, have a detrimental experience for your for your customers. So start to layer on that customer experience as well, and then marry the two of them to to bring up a, a really uh, superior uh, quoting experience, which is becoming an extension of your your brand as a company. So, if your quoting experience is is uh, you know, a smooth uh, experience, I know as, as somebody that receives a lot of quotes from a lot of different vendors, e each vendor does it differently, and some are, are really good, and some not so much. So that that is kind of how my perception is being on the outside of of, of a, a particular uh, vendor or service provider. So I always think you got to have to take that that customer experience into account as you're building these things out. And then as I was talking about a little bit earlier, the resist the urge to over customize. They've done a great job of, of knowing the best practices for selling subscriptions and they've embedded that logic within, within CPQ. Uh, so your, your tendency is you're gonna try to take your business process that you have today and just wholesale migrate it over to there. Uh, to CPQ, I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's the wrong approach. To figure out what they've done, why they've done it, and then optimize your own CPQ experience around that. And of course, there's, there's things that are gonna make yourself special and there's always a, a way to customize or extend the platform, but really taking into account what Salesforce has done with this, why they've done it, and leverage that in your, in your implementations. And I think it is a, a big difference from, from normal Salesforce where you, you do get the ability to really customize and extend. Uh, in this case, you probably don't wanna go down that same path. John, do, do, you, do you find that, uh, that some customers actually overthink, you know, what they, what they need and, and that they, they need to perhaps rely a little bit more on the, the, the solid uh, value that uh, uh, Salesforce represents itself? I mean, uh, I, do, I do believe that that is a problem, that you overthink. You, you, you have certain things that you feel that you have to do uh, because they're part of today's world. Uh, without realizing that maybe you could do things differently or, or better with what Salesforce is offering. And so, it, again, don't resist that temptation to just lift and shift. But thinking about 
how it's how it's implemented, why it's implemented will 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 be better for you in the long run. And we've had several experiences where it's bumped up against our current process, and we've looked at what Salesforce did, and we we made different decisions based on that. And I, I felt that that gave us a much better outcome than, than we would have achieved if we had gone about trying to just incorporate everything into uh, into uh, CPQ. John, let me uh, let me just uh, point out one thing you said here, which is customer experience. I don't think a lot of companies are thinking about customer experience when they're building their CPQ implementation. Uh, a lot of them feel that it's an internal thing that needs to be streamlined rather than making it external facing. Or, or do you feel that the trend is to, because I think that piece is uh, something we need to get out is you need to have the customer in mind as well when you do this. Uh, I would, yeah, I, I agree that you, most most uh, implementations are going to take the internal experience and, and not necessarily think about that that customer experience. And we tend to optimize towards that. That's uh, the stakeholders. The stakeholders have, have pain with their their current implementation, whether that's a spreadsheet or some other tool. They, it's not optimal for them. So they're driving the requirements. So naturally, it's coming from their perspective. And so then we go off and we start to. Uh, implement towards that. So I think when you're when you're setting this thing up and you're starting to figure out what you want to get done, you, you, you have to layer on that customer experience because it is the one thing that is a, a, almost that, that first touch point with the customer where you're, you're presenting mm -hmm. a document to them that's listing the, the products and services and then there's that negotiation that happens. So right. it really changes the customer's perspective of, of your whole organization. Uh, you know, if you're if you're taking into account that what what is the customer going to feel when they see these these documents? How are they going to react? Is it easy yeah. to understand? Is it clear? If I, as you mentioned in some of your earlier points, if I adjust certain parameters, what does that now do for my price? And then uh, right. it gives you that pricing transparency, which eventually will build trust with customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, John. Um, that uh, that that makes uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, so on, I'll just move on to this next slide. Uh, we are. Uh, I, I think one of the things, John, that uh, and Alex as well, is about the team. What do you guys feel is the right team, and how how much do you think it's important to have the right team for a good implementation? I, mean, I think the. The team is critical. If uh, you know, I think that with the, the skill sets that you're going to need on that team, you're going to want somebody with some some experience in in CPQ, and in, in CPQ is really strong in selling subscriptions. So what's how do you, what's the business around selling subscriptions? And, and if you if that is your business model, having somebody that has that subject matter expertise to really guide the decisions that you're making around selling a subscription or, or whatever you. Uh, your company selling, but so you, you need that expertise and then you need some solid Salesforce people. So it is Salesforce. And so having a fundamental understanding of Salesforce, how it works, uh, the, the constraints that the, the platform puts on you, I think you, you, you need to, to, uh, to merge that with that uh, industry or that, that business uh, domain knowledge and experience. I think that is yeah. uh, kind of the, the right mix. How many you, you get on that is uh, how many people you have is, is always a, a question. Uh, but I right. think uh, getting the right mix of, of people that have CPQ experience, have that uh, business domain knowledge, and then also uh, know how Salesforce operates and the constraints of Salesforce is a good mix of, of people to to deliver on on whatever goals you have uh, set out for this. I, I, there's another question that is might not be directly related to what you're talking about, but it does. I do want to ask that. The CPQ technology that is being implemented across Salesforce implementations, um, you know, these days, do you feel, do you guys, uh, I mean, you and Alex, do you guys feel that it's sort of a universal solution for most B2B kind of scenarios? Can it be extended to B2C? Is it industry uh, biased as in um, more towards subscription based tech products or can it be used in manufacturing as well? I know it's, I'm throwing a lot of these things out there, but would just love to see how universal uh, of a solution is this, or is it more um, biased towards the narrower set of problems? So from my experience, you know, I, I think it could be extended to any number of industries, but the thing that attracted us about it was it, it did have that time component. So. 
you know, in your, your standard sales force, it has a, a quantity and it has a product and it's very much in the, more of the, the manufacturing mindset. This, the CPQ layered on that time component and, and allows you to, to really have a, 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 a subscription uh, business and be able to sell subscriptions as subscriptions and be sold. Not just trying to take manufacturing, a manufacturing model and sell subscriptions that way, but to sell subscriptions as they should be sold. And so uh, that was the thing that attracted us to it. And uh, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience outside of uh, a subscription-based company, so maybe Alex can speak a little bit more about uh, those other industries. Sure. Hey, that's sure. a great question, Harun. I think, uh, you know, how, how generic the product is, how we can uh, generalize uh, the Salesforce CPQ uh, for other industries. Um, I think in my opinion, it's, it's more geared towards high-tech um, uh, subscription um, uh, industry. Um, um, it's... Uh, I, my opinion, I think we cannot uh, generalize this uh, solution um, um, for other um, industry specific um, solution. I mean, to some extent, you know, uh, we, we can. I mean, um, you know, there are very simple uh, product offering from, um, you know, investment bank. Yeah, sure, we can use uh, the solution um, uh, for, um, um, investment banking, but it doesn't mean that it kind of will work for every little uh, critical, um, um, you know, selling solutions for investment business. No, maybe, you know, we need some customization or uh, other industry specific um, specific solution, but it's a, it's a great uh, customizable, extensible um, um, platform. Um, but uh, in my experience, what I've seen is mostly, you know, used in high tech subscription over in the yeah and but that's maybe maybe both of our uh, views alex are a little bit um, microscopic uh, and then we don't I'm, i honestly don't know how much of this is going on outside the tech industry but i'm sure salesforce is thinking about it um, let me ask you uh, one question here alex and i know we you might you might you know deflect that question but what do you mean by product versus outcome when setting business drivers? Or I think something similar is design solutions for outcome. Are you saying that this is more, that the whole design should be results based rather than what is going in? Are you talking about this, the, the outputs of the system? That is, that is correct, uh, you know, the, the product is, uh, a tool to code, right? Right. Uh, outcome is uh, how efficiently, how uh, error-free, how um, you know, um, you know, uh, user-friendly code that uh, you are creating. That's your um, outcome. So um, the business driver should be outcome-based and and not product-based. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um... So John talked about um, sticking to the core uh, CPQ model rather than uh, customizing too much. So I think uh, that was an important point. Um, any specific thing, uh, John or Alex, that you guys want to bring up uh, in what you see on this slide or anything outside of that? I think a point to make is that it, it is highly configurable as well. So you can, they, they do offer a lot of options, a lot of uh, uh, ways to toggle different things on and off and set, set your rules. And so uh, not only does it, you know, have very complex functionality, but they've, they've given you ways to, to easily uh, adjust that functionality to, to meet your business needs. And so I think that's one of the other impressive things about, uh, about Salesforce's CPQ product is that you can, you can configure it in so many different ways, uh, but also when you have that many options, understanding how those options will play, um, yeah. some of, some of the math that, that gets uh, gets generated from this, because in the end it, it does come down to numbers, and so uh, understanding how those those configuration options could could impact the, the final result of the calculations. Let me ask you this, John: If you were starting another CPQ implementation. And somebody comes along and says that, hey, I can, I can do it for you because, you know, I've done trailheads and I can do Apex and 
you know, I, 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 I think I can do this. This is, would you, would you accept that? I mean, what would be your bar before you let anybody, you know, take on your CPQ implementation as the lead? I'm not talking about technology, you know, technology, we assume people know that, but what would be your bar before you feel comfortable with somebody taking on a CPQ implementation? Uh, yes, I would, I would look again for uh, that domain experience. So not only do you have trailhead experience of what, what this is, but that you've actually done this before. I don't I just put somebody in, that you described in that, that much of a junior person on a CPQ implementation as a lead. I think they would be, I think they'd be quickly lost and, and buried in, in the, the different details. And you would actually, you know, you probably extend your, your overall implementation time while this this person had to to learn the nuances of CPQ. So I would look for somebody that had a, you know five years of, of industry or, or or domain experience around uh, selling subscriptions, understand uh, what the right uh, output should be based on on the, the business rules that are going into it, and uh, a strong partnership with uh, with a person like that and a, a strong development team. Got it. And and so the without a strong functional person who has done this before it's the project is not going to fly yeah i think it'll take you much longer you will yeah. probably have to reverse some of the the initial assumptions or decisions made uh, over time but somebody that that's been there and, and has, has done that of course is going to be so much more valuable for you all right john i think we uh, haven't even come to some of the work that you have done so why, why don't we jump into that and i'll actually uh, stop sharing my slide uh, and talk about uh, the, some of the work, John, that has happened in Rapid7, what has been the impact of that work, and, and what are the... So I would like to talk about some of the innovations that you guys have done, and what is the impact that you've seen. Yeah, so the, the, we, we've been fortunate at Rapid7 where we got to kind of do this twice. So we had originally uh, rolled out CPQ as a part of our implementation of Salesforce, and. Uh, we kind of did that first uh, thing that I talked about where we, we took functionality that existed in the, the uh, code quoting solution at the time and we just essentially brought it almost over a wholesale and, and, and didn't really stop to say, how do, how do we best want to use this tool? And so uh, that kind of you know, led us to a, a lot of tech debt and uh, some suboptimal things. And I think we, we recently had a, a thing, so we kind of come together and so said, really, how do we want to, as a business, how do we want to sell subscriptions? And that gave us another opportunity to, to implement CPQ. And uh, so then our relationship with uh, Anpo Glenn is, is, uh, came on shortly after our, is the, our first implementation of CPQ. And uh, so we're coming, I guess, up on uh, our three-year anniversary here is coming up soon. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, then to have your teams come in and be a part of actually maintaining what was built originally and, and learning uh, a lot about uh, the way maybe not to do things. Uh, but really understanding the fundamentals of, of CPQ and, and the way we had implemented it at Rapid7. And then, and then to take that knowledge and to help us re, rework a lot of stuff and to really say, okay, we, we, want, to, to, we want to sell subscriptions in, in a whole new way. And so yeah. that is not just Salesforce changes or CPQ changes, there's downstream impacts, there's fulfillment impacts. So it becomes a much wider initiative. Uh, but and the, you know, the benefit was your team had, had been there, had, had helped us with a lot of that, had that experience and was able to, to guide us through that and, and make sure uh, the decisions that were being made that we were able to, to implement them. So I think uh, you know, all those things coming together really helped us meet uh, our goals and, our, uh, and within a reasonable timeline so we didn't have any you know, major extensions because we did things the wrong way and had to rework things. Uh, it was a very well thought out initiative to get us to to where we are today with that kind of re-implementation of, of CPQ. Awesome. So, John, do you want to take a minute to talk about, uh, at a high level, uh, of course, what, because because if I, I'm a little bit familiar with, with that and I know that the um, the transformational stuff that was done was really around uh, getting that power in the hands of your customers, that they have visibility to what they have, what, what they, when the subscriptions are coming due, what they can change, and you know how they can re, um, reorder, renew, and all that. So um, how, what, how painful was, was it technically, and what was the impact of those, some of those initiatives? 
uh, painful for uh, what exactly? From a technical perspective, did you guys have to do a lot of customization to achieve that? Or was it mostly out of the box? And what was what kind of impact have you seen uh, from for that? So, so no, we, we didn't do a lot of, of customizations. I think we, we did a lot of out of the box stuff. We've um, uh, you know tried to, that was our uh, one of our principles going in that we would try to adopt as much of uh, CPQ as we could. Uh, and so I think we, we pretty much stayed within that. There were, there were a few things that we had to deviate from for, for various reasons, but we, we made deliberate decisions, weighed the impacts of those, and uh, ensured, you know, ensured the risk with stakeholders. And so it was a, it was a good discussion. And uh, you know, there were certain times where we said, nope, we're not gonna deviate. And then there were times we said, okay, in this, this case we will deviate and we'll, uh, you know, we'll circle that and make sure that it's well understood. And so uh, I think that does, uh, that's helped us you know, be successful and just still stick with our, with our principles. Awesome. But, uh, so, uh, you know, while, while it was uh, not, I wouldn't describe it as a painful initiative, I think we, the approach we took is we didn't have a data migration. So anytime you get into a data migration, you know, yeah. your level goes through the roof. So we stayed away from that. We said, let's go with a smaller set of, of customers that uh, don't have, you know, don't, don't have a long tail of a whole bunch of subscriptions with us. We originally just started with new, new customers. In and we said, we'll explore the migration uh, in a later phase after we really understand get CPQ stable. And so we're kind of there now. We're starting to explore customer migrations to to uh, the new model. So that really kept the uh, complexity down, allowed us to focus on the functionality without having to worry about data from uh, all these sources and, and getting it to look, look the right way and, and you know, uh, whatever data migrations do to an initiative. Awesome. Um, Awesome, thanks. So we have a couple of questions, but I do want to spend uh, maybe a minute or two asking Leela to talk about what are some of the industry trends that you're seeing that uh, you want to talk about, Leela, and we want to keep it quick so we can get to some questions. And I'll, I'll, I'll share the deck if, um, if that helps. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Arun. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to share my video because of bandwidth issues. Uh, otherwise, my audio would also not be very clear. Am I uh, audible? No problem. We can hear you fine, Leela. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so Harun, are you sharing this? Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. Let me just do that. Right, so till Harun is sharing, uh, Many of our speakers have touched upon uh, guided selling. So uh, that is what that is the beauty that artificial intelligence uh, has brought into CPQ. So uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it enables the users to develop pricing models. And you can, you know, you can even uh, develop a pricing model very specific to a uh, individual customer. That is the level of uh, uh, that is the level of acuteness uh, you can uh, achieve using artificial intelligence uh, with CPQ. Uh, it, it, uh, based, on art, based on the understanding uh, from artificial intelligence, you can uh, decide on what are the different configurations, what are the different uh, subsets of products or bundles that you would like to sell to individual customers. Okay, uh, uh, you can even, it gives you an understanding of, you know, uh, based on historic price patterns, like which of your customers based on their size, uh, which industry they belong to or uh, the size of the company uh, that the customer belongs to, uh, which product configurations or which, uh, which product bundles uh, this customer is likely to buy. Right, so, right, right. All kinds of uh, insight. So that AI have. could... Right, Leela. The other thing is, uh, we have uh, tried this uh, for one of our customers where uh, we have tried uh, using chatbots for preparing quotes. Uh, this is basically an idea to uh, to be able to draw more customers. Uh, so it's it's in the initial phase before somebody is actually a customer to give them an insight about how uh, what is your uh, pricing versus uh, your customers and based on the uh, quantity, how much of a you know, discount they would probably be getting. So uh, it, it's it. a very simple chatbot where they just enter, this is a product that we're looking at and this is the quantity and uh, they get an idea about how much discount and what would be the final uh, cost for them. Got so it. this is Got something it. that we tried for uh, one of our customers. 
Um, Sounds good, Dila. Dila, I'll uh, just we will. Uh, I think this is this is awesome. Uh, I I see mobility there, and I see usage based pricing there. I'm assuming right. both of them are are things that are trends. Um, it would be interesting to see how much of this actually becomes reality. But you know, we don't stop innovating, and we don't stop trying to um, lead or at least keep up with that innovation. Um, any questions? Uh, so, Leela, we'll, we'll turn to some questions now since we only have about six minutes left. Um, and we see a couple of questions from the chat. One of them is uh, Why Salesforce CPQ not a after CPQ? That's from Ankush. Uh, John, do you want to take that? Because you were part of that decision making uh, at Rapid7. Uh, do you want to take that, John? Yeah, so I think for, for our needs, uh, the, you know, I mentioned this before, that the, the thing that really attracted us to, to CPQ was, was the time component, plus that it is native to Salesforce, and it made, it made uh, things a lot easier for us. We didn't have to learn or to learn uh, you know, about CPQ, we didn't have to learn the underlying platform and, and figure out how to, to manage that. We could, we could fold our CPQ functions into our, our normal workflow and, and just deliver w w as one, one platform and not have to have you know, different ways of operating. So those are some of the, the factors that went into our decision and uh, it was really early on. So when we, we decided to go with Salesforce, the, the decision was made to also uh, leverage CPQ, and so I think that was uh, some of the things that that went into those decisions. Uh, and you know, we we don't we wrap that. Uh, I'm yeah. sure Chris does a, that, a great that's problem. a very powerful powerful statement, John. That we don't regret that. I think right. I, even more powerful than we're very happy with our decision. <laughs> I'll awesome. Take a the uh, there's another question. I actually go to the first one first. Uh, financial for CPQ. Uh, so. Uh, what does financial force CPQ? I don't know if anybody here is qualified to comment on that. So I think I will, will move on. Um, so another question is, is there provision of penalty rules if customer breaks the contract? Uh, and how do we ensure minimum touch points? While so let's take the first one first. Uh, have you, John, or you, Alex, dealt with any penalty rules in, in case of customers breaking the contract? I wouldn't refer to it as penalty. I think anytime you you have a, if you're having a usage based model, if this is what the question is referring to, and they've gone over their limits, there's always a a, a true up function that you would you would invoke at that point in time, and and uh, be able to get the customer back up to paying back up to what uh, what they're consuming. So I think there is an opportunity to also build that out, and then there's there's uh, you know you maybe don't have to immediately if they go past their limits, you don't have to immediately invoke that, but it's over time. Maybe you have more of a smoothing model where maybe one month they spike, but other months they're lower. So I think Salesforce gives you a good good opportunity to to see how usage is happening through their their, their billing module and, and also to to manage those different things as how you want to run your business. Do you want to immediately bill the customer for overages? Somebody could break a contract by saying, hey, I don't I bought it, I signed it for one year, but I don't use it. I don't want to pay for it anymore. Oh, if they terminate contracts. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. So, the, the, yeah, that depends on your business uh, model. If you do allow them to uh, break contracts and what are the legal ramifications for that? Uh, I don't know that CPQ helps you helps you do that. Uh, that's more of a, you know, a, a business decision on how you handle those, those scenarios. That would probably be part of the whole CLM, uh, John, right? So once somebody has to sign some legal contract saying hey, you I'm signing up for one year and these are the terms. And if I break them, then yeah. So I, I guess it will, it's, it's at some point somebody signs up and I'm sure, you know, legal teams from both sides will need to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually have seen people saying that they get into one, when that happens, they allow people to uh, CPQ, they have done some CPQ implementation that allow people to scale back and change and all that. Um, so rather than you know um, angering a client or uh, turning away a client, you know you find ways to work with them through their tool. 
The last question here is how do we ensure minimum touch points while configuring complex bundled products while using CPQ in order to enhance the customer experience? How do you ensure minimum touch points? Um, I don't know. I think that's basically, um, that's, that's the whole automation piece, right? The approvals and all that, I guess. Right, yeah, the t tapping into that, uh, the power of their approvals engine, uh, the sales forces, workflows or process builders can always be invoked in the background. Uh, yeah, so there's a, you know, in number of ways to be able to uh, automate things and to avoid, avoid touch points and, and only have the touch points that are necessary. Yeah. Awesome. I think we've run out of time. So to respect everybody's schedules, I'll hand it back to Peter to to close this. Um, thanks so much again, everybody for joining. Um, and it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Leela, for all your contributions. That's great, guys. Back to you, Peter. Yeah, and, and, and fantastic. Uh, uh, good job. And it, it is hard, you know, when there's so much to talk about. This is a, this is a pretty complex, uh, you know, uh, situation that we're talking about. And there's so many nuances to it, whether you're a new customer, old customer, you know, there's some transformational things that are caught, that get caught up in. But regardless, uh, uh, thank you, gentlemen. I thought you did a great job. And, and for those people that, uh, that have questions left over, we do, we have copy of that trail and we will follow up with you, uh, you know, and, and make sure that you get um, uh, your answers. And I, I really would like to finish up by saying, from a corporate perspective, it's our mission at InfoGlen to treat every client really as a partner. I mean, it's our mindset, it's our goal. We believe that we actually put a, by putting a vested interest in, in their outcomes, that our outcomes uh, become obvious. And so, in closing, I will only like to say that if during today's session that you saw something or you heard something that resonated with you and you'd like to extend that conversation and continue it, um, you know, you're more than welcome. We have, you know, we can make some arrangements for a personal call or a more intimate call with you. And, and of course, I'd love to see you back on our next, uh, on our next webinar. Yeah, look forward. You know. Uh, we'll, we'll be sharing more details in the next webinar soon. Absolutely. But uh, there's a couple of contacts that I can give you directly. And our, our base email that comes into our executive is the word contact at infoglen.com. Or you can call us on our direct line, which is 408-642-5329. And there's always going to be somebody uh, available to uh, set something up with one of our specialists. Uh, Haroon is a very hands-on CEO, and uh, he loves taking your calls. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not giving you too much work there, Haroon, but I, I know that you take those calls. <laughs> So thanks Absolutely. again, everybody. Uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you ne uh, the next time. John, great job. Alex, great job. Thank you, Leela, uh, on, on for that. I know you got pushed in at the last minute. I really appreciate that very much. Everyone else, have a, have a great Easter weekend. I, I just Absolutely. realized you're having Easter weekend. Stay safe, stay home, and save some lives. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Hey.